Genesis chapter 12. This evening's theme is Abraham, a, a man of faith. You probably know the story of Abraham. Uh, have probably heard the story or read the story in Genesis chapter 12 probably many times as I have. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a new beginning for him where the Lord takes a hold of his life while he's living his life uh, with his family, his father, his mother, his brothers, his sisters, his aunts, his uncles, you know, his nephews, it's just his whole family's there and all of a sudden God comes in and and just calls him out of that he, he he literally removes him from his whole way of living uh, he has mothers and brothers and all these relatives and then he comes in and says abraham i want you to move and, and that takes faith in god to do you have to totally trust god with your very life to do something like to leave everything that you know to leave the security the love the family all of that to go into a whole new way of, of life um, is life-changing in itself and challenging as you take that step of faith. And we're going to see that through the life of Abraham, how he deals with that. He doesn't always deal with it right or correctly, but he, uh, he does take that step of faith to, to live that way. And, and if I can make this point for all of you and for myself, is that at one point in our life, God called us out of this world. Uh, he, through a message, through the word, whatever situation that you went through, all of a sudden you said, I need God. Uh, and it might have been because you were sick, maybe you were ill, financial problems, and you're thinking, I need to go back to God and find some answers. Uh, I need his help. And, and that's wonderful and that's good. We all were there at one point. I know in my life it was just uh, a need to know who God was. I know others have gotten sick with cancer and they decided, well, let's go to church and maybe God can help me. But it doesn't stop there. Our faith in God, in Christ Jesus, is only the beginning. It is a walk and a relationship with God where we are totally surrendered to him and we're obedient to him and his word because now our life begins to change. And that old life, the way you used to live or the way that you're living now possibly, has to change. Uh, the Bible is very clear that you must be born again. And when that new life comes in, your whole perspective of life changes. You don't even desire the, the things that... Um, that are out there anymore it's interesting because i had a little culture shock coming back and i'm kind of sad that i know eventually it's going to go away and i'm going to get back into this culture here in america going to south sudan uh, the family wanted to go see that that new movie um civil um america or, or whatever the guy's name captain america they wanted to go see that movie i guess it's the big hit right now and everyone's uh, watching it and so I went and the whole time I'm sitting there just thinking man I don't want to be here just what a dumb movie you know it's like it's like what a waste of time and and I'm just thinking all this and I started crying a couple of times during the whole movie and I'm thinking I think I got culture shock you know I, I think it's culture shock and, and afterwards I even told my wife what a stupid movie and I love movies like that I love movies like I love uh, I love the Batman Superman movie that was one of the greatest movies you know but that's what god does all of a sudden he starts removing things from your life where they become less important to you and, and those are good things and you should be willing to give those things up for the lord if he's asking you to i'm not saying you have to i'm not telling you that i'm telling you to do it but if god is asking you to do that you need to do that that's the new life that god gives us in christ jesus so this man was a man of faith though he made many many mistakes and we'll see it as we go through the word We've already noticed in the book of Genesis, as we started several months ago, that it is a, it is a book of beginnings, uh, new beginnings, the beginning of, of creation in itself, right? The beginning of a human race, the beginning of marriage and family with Adam and Eve, and even the beginning of sin as they sinned and brought in sin into the world and then imputed that sin to us because by Adam's nature it was given to us and so we become sinners also and we know the wages of sin is death and so God needed to do that and so he begins to um, give us the answer uh, to that problem of sin through his son Jesus Christ and then we see um, here the beginning of a people the Jewish people 
uh, that will turn into a nation and that will be a nation that represents God because God will pour into them and, and he will separate that nation just like he separates us individually and he will use that nation to minister to all the other nations because God's hand will be on them. If you go through the book of Judges and you'll find out that that um, uh, Joshua is given the baton from, from Moses and, and all of a sudden um, as they go to Jericho the people already know who they are. Oh yeah, we've heard the stories and how God delivered you from the hand of Egypt. So they're already uh, being known for uh, a group of people that a great God is in control of and so uh, the beginning of a new people and God does that with us too, right? Because he calls us out of the word and he begins to do things in our life. We all have our own faith it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and it is our faith and it's different than anyone else's faith and we need to walk that faith. We need to believe in that faith. Now, the faith in a noun is the faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, that whole fundamentals of Christianity. We all have to believe that fundamentals, but we all walk that faith because we all come from different lives. Even, even if you're siblings, you have a different walk than your sibling uh, because you're made as an individual and God had created you specifically as you are. And so that faith that you have, you have to walk it. No one else can walk that for you. Uh, that's one thing that I don't try to do for people is walk it for them. Though they come to me always with with uh, questions, you know, and, and could you give me some counseling? And, and I never tell them you have to do this. Uh, I always tell them, you know, you're on the right track. You know, keep praying, keep seeking the Lord. He'll He'll give you the wisdom because it's your faith. I can walk it for you, but you're going to be walking my faith and what I would do in the situation. And really, you want to read the word and hear what God would have you to do. You know, And he has given us his word to live by. So it's a personal faith that we each have. So this is the beginning of a Jewish family. Uh, Abraham is the father. The Jews today still reference Abraham as their father. Um, they understand their genealogy and they know where they came from through Abraham, who is the father of the Jewish nations, the 12 tribes of Israel, which uh, we now see today there in Israel. So let's go ahead and begin this uh, chapter in verses 1 through 3 as we see God calls Abraham out of the land of Ur into a greater promise, a greater thing. And it's always a greater thing. When you're called out of the world, you're called to something so awesome beyond what you can understand or recognize, it will blow you away. I mean, the world can be exciting. There can be a lot of things going on in the world uh, that, that may excite a person to the point that, that life is good. But when you come to the other side, in a sense, to the true side, and you begin to walk with God, it is amazing what God will begin to do in your life. The miracles that you'll see, the lives that will change, the, the possibilities that God will use you. I'm still blown away by the fact that in South Sudan, there are five people that accepted the Lord through, through my preaching of, the, of a simple message of what the church is. You know, and when they heard that message of what the true church is and how it's not a building, it's not a place, but it is a personal relationship with God, they realized I need that relationship. And they raised their hands and they asked Jesus to come into their hearts. And now they're there. And now they're going to walk their faith and they're going to impact their world. And that's amazing for me. Uh, in the world, I never would have thought South Sudan, why would I go there? What would be a purpose to go to South Sudan? Yeah, I'd rather go to Vegas, you know, or go to the beach or go to Hawaii if I was in the world. That would be exciting. But South Sudan now is like, wow, Lord, what you could do and what you did. Um, I'm more blessed than they were because of that experience. So it, it's a greater promise. It's a greater promise, uh, a walk with God. So verse 1 says, Now the Lord said or had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, so we will be looking at father abram at this point from chapter 12 all the way to chapter 24 so genesis takes a good part of that book just to deal with abram in his whole uh, life abraham is called from 
Samarium of paganism to faith in a living God and God grants him an unconditional set of promises as he calls him out of his family into a new land. Uh, God promises to lead him to a land of Canaan uh, which is an earthly scene for working out God's promises. Canaan is a typology of uh, of our walk with him in the world. It is not a type of go into the land of Canaan and God will give you heavenly blessings. It is a type of the flesh you're going to be battling all the time because once they went into the land of Canaan, they were battling the uh, different tribes there, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and, and all of them. They had to fight them. And that represents our Christian walk. As we walk by faith, you know, we're going to deal with the flesh. The flesh will want to live through us and we need to, as Paul tells us in Romans, crucify the flesh because that old man should be dead. You need to reckon him dead. He is dead completely already in Christ Jesus. We just have to leave him dead. What we do is we carry that. If you can imagine a dead body, if you were dead, you know, you're dead to the world. That means you should have no feelings, no no desire for the world because you're, you're dead, right? Like a dead body, you know, you can go over it and spit on it and cuss at it and throw all kinds of things. What does a dead body do? nothing it's dead you know a lot of us try to carry that dead body with us you know we're going to carry him all around and just kind of cater to its needs but it's dead it should be dead and it, 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 as a christian believer yet we deal with that flesh constantly the flesh is with us we're made up of flesh and we're made up of the spirit our soul and who we are and it lives in this body and that's why there's a battle because the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and so the 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 new born again spirit in us wants god loves god desires god and then the spirit the the flesh wants the things of the world and fulfill its needs so that's why the battle is going on so if you can crucify that flesh then the spirit will win and the more that you feed the spirit the more it gains strength and it has victory over the flesh that's our battle and when with his body dies, it goes back to the ground and our spirit goes to heaven and we're with the Lord forever. And that's why the body needs to be a new body uh, when the Lord comes back for us. And the new body will be in agreement with the spirit and then we will live eternally with the Father. So it's an awesome thing that God is doing. Um, it's been more than 300 years since the flood of Noah. <clears throat> it's been a long time since God has really spoken uh, to anyone, uh, especially in light of after the whole um, Babel, the tower being rebuilt and God having to judge and divide the nation. So God really hasn't spoken to many people. And all of a sudden, chapter 12, it says the Lord said to Abram. The Lord said to Abram. Now we know in Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen gives us in his little discourse to the Jewish people about the nation Israel he gives us a little bit more understanding in Acts chapter 7 verse 2 he, as he said to the brethren and fathers listen he says the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran so God had gone before here in chapter 12 he tells us from uh, Haran that point to the future but in Acts, Stephen says, no, before that, God was already working in his life. I like that because God does that. He's working in your life, possibly, if, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior or you know that he worked in you before you came to a point where you said, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I know personally, uh, he allowed me to go through many things and then I accepted Jesus Christ. So where at that point did Abraham accept Jesus? We don't really know or accept God. Uh, We really don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but we know that God was working in his life, uh, giving him understanding. The Jews in the Old Testament did not look to Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They looked to the Messiah as their deliverer. They looked to the future. So when Abraham came to the Lord, he put his faith in what the Messiah would do in the future. He didn't put his faith in specifically Jesus Christ, you know, because he, he wasn't born yet. He didn't die yet. But he knew that the Messiah was coming, Genesis chapter 3, that there would be a seed that would crush the enemy's head. So he knew a Messiah was coming, so he believed God that that Messiah who was coming would save them and deliver them uh, from their sins because they were offering up sacrifices and offerings and so forth in replacement and atonement for their sins but it was temporal 
And so they literally had to believe in what was coming. And you see that through the Psalms with David. He totally understood that. And that's why he was a man after God's own heart. Had his own faith walk and had a special relationship uh, with the Lord. So it seems like God was silent for a while. And I know that sometimes it seems that God is silent in our lives. Uh, we go through periods in our walk with him where he is silent. He doesn't seem to be saying much. And you're wondering, where are you, God? Have you forgotten about me? And, and those times are normal. Uh, those are times where God is allowing you to walk by faith and trusting in him. And it's very important that we understand that we're not to live by sight, but by faith, that we don't just look at things. And again, the flesh wants to look at things. The flesh wants to live in the world. The flesh wants its own desires and it wants to see its own results. And so it always looks at everything and its own desires. But the spirit lives in the kingdom of God where it understands that we live through the word of God that is Jesus Christ and he's that example so we're to know the word of God and live by the word of God and we're to trust him and so as he as he sometimes allows us uh, to go a little bit so we don't sense his presence we, we sense he may be gone we sense he's absent but we should believe the word of God that no he said I will never leave you I will never forsake you and so Believing that by faith, by faith. And, and I believe that once you learn that lesson, where you can walk without feelings, without seeing, all of a sudden he begins to give you seeing and feeling again. But it's a good seeing and it's a good feeling with the Lord. So Genesis 12 is a reminder that God never forgets his people. Even after the whole rebellion of Babylon even after three and a half years, three and a half centuries of seeming silent, God had not forget, forgotten them. He begins to speak to Abram here. So God calls Abram out of the world into a life of blessing. He pretty much says, look, pack up your bags. I want you to leave your family, your relatives. I want you to leave everything. And I want you to uh, come and follow me. And as you follow me, I will bless you. I will lead you. I will guide you, guide you all of the way. And by the way, I'm not going to tell you where you're going you're just going to have to trust in me by faith and our walk of faith is really that trusting God that he's leading us in the right direction because we don't know where he's leading us I know we want to know and it would be nice to know where God's leading you and and what is happening but God doesn't do that because he wants you to trust in him a hundred percent I'm the type of person like well tell me what I'm going to be doing and I'll do it because if I commit to it, I'll do it. I promise I'll do it. I mean, that's just my personality and my walk. And if he tells me, and I know that, that he's telling me, I will do it, like the whole South Sudan trip. I didn't want to go. When they asked me, I'm like, no, I'm not going. But, you know, they're standing in front of me. Well, I'll pray about it. And that's a Christian thing to do, right? Tell them, oh, I'll pray about it. So I did. And then all of a sudden, the Lord said, go. I'm like, oh, no. So now I got to go. So he, he told me very clearly to go. But there are times when God doesn't tell you clearly. He's just saying, just follow me. That, I, I, just through experience, that seems to be one of the questions that a lot of Christians have. What does God have for me? What does he want in, for my life? I think that's a question that we all ask. At one point or another, if you're a Christian, you've asked that. But what does God want of me? Does he, he wants to do something great, because they always say that from the pulpit. God wants to do something great in your life. And we're thinking great like, you know, on TV with a big screen and everyone's looking at us type of great, but not necessarily that. Uh, great to God is different than what we think is great. God doesn't always tell us exactly what he wants to do. I wasn't told that I was going to be a preacher. You know, I'm sure that others weren't told that they were going to be worship leaders. God just began to slowly move them in a direction, and he'll lead and guide you in those directions. And so he begins to lead Abraham and for him to leave everything, everything. And God was going to bless him. He's going to give him a new land. He's going to make him into a great nation. He's going to bless his name. Others will prosper him, and he'll even protect him as he, as he goes. And so he goes and he leaves. And then we come to verse 4 through 5. Abram departs uh, with Lot and his possessions. After a while, he finally uh, makes the decision to go. So it says in verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 
Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. So Abram went forth as the Lord spoke to him and gave him that command, and he went. Asked no questions. Uh, He didn't try to alter the plans. He was obedient to the Lord. He got up, he packed his stuff, and he literally went as the Lord directed him. Now, he's, it says he's 50 years old here, but that was not, uh, I'm sorry, it says he's 75, but that was not his initial age. He was literally 50 when God first called him. So 25 years kind of went by before the Lord um, moved him to to leave. Um, God doesn't move on our time. God will direct and lead us as he guides us, and sometimes it takes a while uh, before he does answer uh, us and gives us that direction. God's timing is different than ours. So obviously Abram uh, faltered a little bit as you read that, right, because he had said, leave everything, take nothing with you, and yet he he kind of uh, sinned in a sense, and he did not uh, listen or was not obedient to the Lord where he did fail to... Um, bring not bring his family uh, some of his possessions just in case you know he started letting the flesh come in well you know maybe i need some companionship you know god isn't enough and oh maybe i need a few items here and there just in case i might need some resources and to take care of some things and so he started to bring stuff when god told him just leave everything just leave everything the old testament is interesting in that it doesn't try to cover up our sins it's just giving us the history of these people and so when you read things like this you go wow Abraham was a sinner he really struggled now that relates to me because I kind of understand Abraham and I understand that he struggles I struggle I'm like wow okay I don't feel so bad about myself it's just who we are as human beings then you read stories of Abraham all of a sudden marrying his servant maid and thinking wow why would he do that how could God accept that you know and then you read today in South Sudan you know they'll have 10 wives or 15 wives and the highest that one guy said uh, he that he's uh, known someone who had 50 wives and I'm thinking wow how can someone have 50 wives you know and yet God still be there that's one of the struggles over there with the chaplains um, when they have so many wives and they become a Christian the question is what do I do with my wives yeah what do you do with all those wives well you don't you don't neglect them And you don't just let them go. You take care of your wives. Uh, But I believe that you should have one wife. And so you should choose out of all those wives and have that one wife. But the rest you have to take care of because you're committed to take care of them. I think that would be the right thing to do. But what a dilemma to have, right? And so the Old Testament just reveals what really happening. But the New Testament is different. It's interesting because the New Testament is is the dispensation of grace and how God views us through Jesus Christ, which is so different than how God viewed us in the Old Testament through the law, because the law reveals that we're sinners, that we can't keep the law. So Abraham couldn't keep God's commandments because it's not in his own nature and strength to do so. Only through the Spirit could he do that. But listen to a few scriptures that I thought were interesting. Hebrews chapter 11 says, By faith Abram, when he was called to go out into the place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing whether he went. It just basically says he was obedient to him and he went. Never mentioned about it taking anything, just make, said, hey, he was obedient. Galatians 3, 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Did he really believe God? Well, the Old Testament kind of says, yeah, he believed to a certain degree, but he doubted in the sense he needed to bring some family, needed to bring some possessions, but yet the New Testament says he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Romans 4, 1 says, we shall, we shall or what shall we say that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found. For if Abram were justified by the works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. For what says the scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him unto righteousness. So it reveals Abraham as a righteous man, never mentions his flaws at all. You, you would think they would say somewhere, you know, he struggled with his flesh, but it doesn't. 
because it views through the lens of Jesus Christ. And that's how God views you. You're already complete. Um, you're, you're battling this world from, from the standpoint of victory in Christ Jesus. You know that, right? We've already won the war. We're just living out this life as best we can to glorify God while we're here. And so we live in the kingdom of God and we are to be servants of God. We're to proclaim the gospel message. We're to be fruitful uh, in the things that we do for the Lord. But we're, we're fighting and battling this world through victory. We've already won. We already sinned the heavenly realms. Yeah, we struggle. Yeah, our flesh is weak. Yeah, we make mistakes. Yeah, we make bad choices, but we can repent and turn. And that's, that's the option God has given us, true repentance, you know, saying, hey, I'm sorry. I'm going to make amends. I'm going to do the right thing. And then God restores you and you move on in this world. But if, if you fight from the point that you think you need to strive or have something that you don't have, then you're not fighting from the point of victory. You're fighting from the standpoint of the world. Because you want something that uh, God doesn't want you to have. And that's a battle to go through. Uh, we struggle to obey because we struggle to believe that God's way will really work out for our best interests. Because we don't see that. And yet God sees something that you don't see. Uh, God is always working out things for our good. His ways are always the best ways. They're, they're so much far and above our ways uh, than, than, than anything we could imagine or think. And so we need to trust him. So like Abram, we need to listen and to trust God completely because we're under God's grace. And so now Abram travels through the land of Canaan as he leaves everything. He begins to move now to the land of Canaan as God directed him. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, verse 6 as far as the Terebeth tree of Moroni, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Uh, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. And he removed from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There... He built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still towards the south. So God shows Abram the land that his, in, his descendants would inherit. And so he now fulfills his first promise to Abraham. This is the land where your descendants will be, where all your sons and, and I will begin to bless you while you're there. And he goes as far as it says there, a Terebeth tree and Morin, uh, that area there. Uh, and then he builds an altar unto the Lord, which tells us a few things, which tells us a few things about Abraham. He had a, a, a relationship with God because he builds an altar to worship the Lord. Uh, and he was a witness because altars were used as witnessing that I was here as a monument to, to, to share with others that we dwelt in this land. And so not only was he uh, in a personal relationship with God, but he was also sharing it with others that he knew God and loved God. And so he builds this altar to the Lord, not a false altar. There are false altars. And we're not to have false altars. We are to have only one altar. Anything false is idolatry. Paul even said covetousness is idolatry. And if you want this world, you're in idolatry. And, and that person needs to repent. Deuteronomy 12, 1 says, These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord your God uh, your father gives you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. So he gives us a set of rules in Deuteronomy and and. Abram uh, will understand these rules. Um, he understands that God has guidelines and he has to live within those guidelines. But in Deuteronomy it says, You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispose serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. And that's God's heart. That is God's heart. It's what the Bible says. He doesn't like altars, false altars. He doesn't want them in your lives. You need to remove those false altars. He will not abide in you with those false altars. God is God. He dwells within us. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. And God is not going to occupy our hearts with anything else but him. 
He doesn't want Satan there. He doesn't want his altars there. He doesn't want covetousness there. He wants them out. And we are to destroy them, whether on the mountains or in the valleys, whatever that, take them out, get rid of them. Because they're no good. They only bring disaster, false worship in us. We see that through Saul himself. We, he began to offer up uh, uh, sacrifices to false idols and it destroyed him. The kingdom was taken away from him. We see it with the children of Israel and the kings divided after Solomon and began to offer up idols and bring them into the temple of God and God had to destroy it. Caused Babylon to come down and destroy the whole temple. It was Nehemiah who said, we need to rebuild it. But what a disaster all of that is and we think that God won't do that with us. We're thinking wrong. God loves us enough that he will destroy us. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a couple that were sitting in the church and Paul says, I've already prayed that their bodies would be destroyed, that their souls would be saved. That's serious stuff when you read it. We need to take it seriously. The word of God and what he says. He doesn't want altars in our life. They're false altars. They need to be destroyed. Uh, you know, he wants a monument. He wants worship. You know, when, when we went to the moon, finally, America, the first one on the moon. What do we do? We, we put a flag there, right? And it had the, the stripes and the stars and we made it as a monument that, that we were here first, so forth. Well, that's what God wants in our lives. He wants an altar uh, to him uh, because he is our God and we're letting people know that he is our God in our lives and we're not going to you know, um, compromise whatsoever. We're going to give in to him than to the flesh or even to this world. And we'll see here that Abraham builds this altar to show that he's a worshiper. He, he doesn't even pitch, he just pitches a tent, doesn't even build a, a, a home for himself because he understands this isn't my home. This, this is a place where I'm just visiting and a pilgrim and I won't stay here forever because I have a new home. He looked to the city with a foundation that is built by his maker and that is God as Hebrews 11.10 says. So he totally trust, trust in the Lord and he looked to heaven to heaven, to his home, and not this earth that is perishing. It is dis being destroyed. And Peter says one day we'll be totally annihilated in fire and God will create a new one. And so he worships the Lord. And as believers, we need to worship the Lord. True worship, not false worship. Uh, you know, we need to come in here with a right heart. Too many people come to church with the wrong heart. They're really in the world and they love the world and the things of the world and then they raise their hands and they worship God. That, that is hypocrisy and blasphemy to do that. James says, you know, they, they, they cuss with their words in their mouth and then they try to praise God with the same lips. Wow. And, and, and we think that God's okay with that. No, he's not. God will deal with that. God will deal with you if we don't repent and turn to God and worship him in his described manner. He wants a pure, Psalms 15 says, who shall ascend to the holy hill of the Lord? Who? Who has the right to ascend to the holy? But he who has clean hands and a clean heart will ascend to the holy hill. Only those who are righteous in Jesus Christ who have totally surrendered their lives to the Lord they're the ones that are going to enter into the throne room of grace and find mercy at time of need. The hypocrisy, we need to get rid of that. God sees it. I don't see it. I don't know you. I'm not pointing at anyone here because I don't know you. But God knows you. He knows your very heart and your very intent. And you're not hiding from him. Not hiding from him at all. He sees everything. So now Abraham, so deal with that. Deal with it. Get rid of that, please, because for your sake... Um, I'm, I'm just saying for your sake, God will begin to bless you when you turn back to him. Abram lacks uh, trust here in verses 10 through 13. <clears throat> yeah, keep, keep watch on my time because I can't see it up there. Verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there. For the famine was severe in the land and it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful context, continents. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. 
Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Now that is an interesting section of scripture there. Peter actually quotes that section there and gives glory to Sarah, Sarai, who becomes Sarah later on, and, and really instructs women of the New Testament church to be like her in being uh, honored and, and respected as a wife, uh, something to think about. But we see more of Abraham's faults here again as he does not trust God in providing for his family nor for his protection. And so he takes hands into matters into his own hands, uh, thinking that he knows better than God and that he can protect himself better than God. Uh, he forgot already, verse 3, where he says, I, uh, I will curse him who curses you. You know, God is his protection and God will take care of everything. And he does, which I find interesting because God does take care of him, even in light of the fact that he, uh, you know, didn't trust God and took matters in his own hand. God's going to keep his promises to us. You, know, you read the book of Corinthians and that book is written to a carnal church. It's a church that's living in the flesh. And you see that, as I mentioned, the reference in, in chapter 5. But you see it throughout the church, even as they were coming together and their love feasts and they were bringing food and people were bringing more food and eating in front of people that couldn't afford it and they were just like, you know, uh, flaunting it in front of them that they were wealthier than the others. And then you see the battles in there uh, within the book and you just wonder, man, these people, and yet they're carnals. But yet Paul, Paul is addressing them as the part of the body of Christ. God is, God is faithful to keep his promises. You know, and if you are his child, he will keep you because you're his child. I mean, you may have a rough time in this life. You may struggle constantly, you know, and it's a battle uh, and stressful, but God is faithful. If you're his child, the, the day that you die, you go to heaven um, because it's the work of Jesus Christ and not our work. So it seems that Abram had no faith in God or his promises, so he looks to the world for answers. And Egypt is a type of the world. When the children of Israel are in bondage to Egypt, God pulls them out of the world. Again, another example of you can't live in this world anymore as Christians. You've got to get out of it. That means you've got to stop seeing your old friends. You've got to stop taking advice from your worldly friends. you got to stop reading those worldly magazines. You've got to stop reading the horoscope. You've got you to stop all that garbage that just destroys you and continues to feed the flesh. You need to be in the Word of God. You need to get out of it. And you need to create good godly relationships uh, he was scared obviously for his life here so he took matters into his own hands god is more than able to provide for us and keep us safe more than able interesting um i, I met this young man his name was peter peter and we became close friends in south sudan he had uh, been a young man and he was fighting in the war and he was on the front line and the enemy captured him, killed his whole platoon, but they captured him, uh, which is Muslims in the north part of Sudan. And so they had him in a pit for eight months with his hands tied up like this, uh, you know, to, to cut the ropes and fed him and various things like that. But he was pretty much like this in the pit. So they finally decided, as they do so many times, uh, to... Um, indoctrinate him into the uh, Muslims and they thought they did so they cut him down and they began to train him to fight for him for them so they taught him how to fly out of planes they taught him how to fight combat how to use weapons and and so forth and so he learned all of this stuff and at the same time he trusted God that God was in control of his life that God would protect him that God would lead and guide him and so on the day that they said okay we wanted to put you on the front line to fight against South Sudan he says, okay. And so as soon as he went to the front line, he walked right back to South Sudan and he joined with his people. <laughs> and now he, he trains the South Sudan to fight against them because he knows uh, some of their ways and, and fighting tactics, you know. So that's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. You know, I was telling them, I said, I've seen war movies. I've seen Vietnam. And why do some men live? Why do some men die? That's all in God's hands. I mean, I'm sure bullets are flying all over the place and you can hear them, you know, and all the guys are going, yep, yep. A lot of them have bullet holes. A lot of them have been in the front line and they totally get what I said, that God is in total control. They have that peace, that peace that God's in control. And I think that's why by the second week I was like, wow, Lord, you're an amazing God that you have us right 
where you want us. We don't have to fear anything. So you take our bodies. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. You know, what, what greater blessing that would be. But Abraham, you know, was scared. And, and so he began to uh, think, what do I do here? Well, um, in their culture, uh, possibly uh, one, one commentator said that, that in their culture they would call their sister because their wife's sister too because of their same nationality in a sense, but they weren't really brother and sister. Um, possibly she was half sister. It's another another idea. And so he used that as an excuse. Well, she's my sister. Tell them that you're my sister and hopefully they'll let me, let me live. Um, and so she did. She was obedient. Um, I mean, this is a man of faith, and now he's asking his wife to, to go in there and, and, in a sense, lie, because no matter what, it's a lie. You know, even though it's a half a lie, it's still a lie. And this is a far cry from God's mandate as a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5.25. So we see here <clears throat> that he uh, puts his faith in himself. And he'll repeat this, which I find interesting, because he'll do the same thing again. But God uses it, which I think is even more interesting uh, for his glory. So we see the father of faith, because Abraham is known as the father of faith, you know, which is kind of interesting too, and yet he's faltering in that arena of having faith. He's struggling there. Uh, and, and men do. It seems like when we think that we're strong in an area, it's really because we're weak in that area. Look at Noah. He got drunk, and then sin entered into his family's life. Moses, the meekest man on the earth, and yet he struck that rock in, in, in uh, pride and in anger. Uh, even Peter, ready to take on the whole army for his Savior, and then when it came right down to it, a, little, a girl asked if he was you know, a part of them, and he just said, no, no, I don't even know the man. You know, uh, In our strengths, God sometimes humbles us. We need to be careful that we don't think that we're strong in an area, you know. Oh yeah, I would never do that, you know. Be careful, because you probably will when it comes right down to it. Um, at this point, uh, you might say, no problem for me, I'll never fail there, and I, I, I know who I believe in, I'll trust in him, I'll die for him, and yet God will test you in that area, he really will. So he tested uh, Abraham and he failed. He failed. But God has a way of working things out for good, for his glory. And so we see here in verse 14 through 20. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful, a totally different type of uh, nation and people. And Sarah was very different, but she was so different that she was so beautiful to the Egyptians that they would want to keep her. And that was their custom back then. You know, you were the king, you know, you, you ruled and, and, and you wanted your harem to be big because the bigger your harem, the greater the king you are. And so he saw this beautiful woman and he decided to take her as his wife. The prince of Pharaoh, verse 15, also saw her, uh, commanded her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep, oxen, uh, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels, but the Lord uh, plagued Pharaoh. So you see where this is going. All of a sudden, you know, uh, Abraham's kind of outside in the camp, you know, and, and Sarah is in the kingdom palace and Pharaoh's got her. And so he's very appreciative that he gets Abram's sister. And so he starts giving him camels and donkeys and food and provisions and just keeps giving and giving. And all of a sudden Abraham's, you know, getting rich here. And God is just doing a work through his uh, mistake and sin in his life. So he treated him well for his sake. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Now, um, how did he know? I don't know how Pharaoh knew. Maybe he, he talked to Abram before. Maybe they had conversations about who Abram was, where he's going, uh, why he's going. God told me to go, and so I'm following directions, you know. And then at that time is when he asked for his sister, you know, to be a part of his harem. But all of a sudden he realized, wait a minute, I'm getting plagued here. 
And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. And so now God fulfilled his second promise to him. He now has wealth, provisions, and he will be taken care of as he now continues to go to the land of Canaan to to possess it. Um, That's our walk of faith. That's his walk of faith. And, And it was a great walk for him because many nations will come from him because of the promise that God made to him. And so the Jewish people expand and grow and multiply as the stars of heaven to this day. We also have a faith that we are to walk. Walk it. I encourage you to walk it and walk it with great understanding that God is your leader and he is leading you and guiding you for his glory. Don't walk Abraham's walk. Don't, don't think that, oh, well, I'm just going to leave all my whole family. I don't think God is calling us to leave our family. You know, you're not going to a land of Canaan, and you're not going to start a whole new tribe of people. You don't know. God's not calling you to do that. You know, God's calling you, you to walk your faith in this time and age in our world. And if anything, you're to reach your family with the gospel message by you being loving and caring for them by you being the example the light and the salt to your family but be careful that you don't compromise with your family and let's you know well they go out and party so let's go out and party with them maybe we'll reach them you know no you're not going to reach them you're only going to compromise and fall into sin and then god's got to deliver you somehow you know in the meanwhile you're giving them a bad name and they're wondering what have you done to us you know it's all your fault because of your god it's like oh i'm sorry (laughs) you know but God loves you. Come to the Lord. So walk your faith, whatever that faith is. If, if you're a man, then walk that faith according to the New Testament scriptures. A woman, then walk it as a woman because God has chosen you to be who you are. You know, I don't know why he's chosen you to be a man or a woman. Bruce Jenner obviously doesn't know either. <laughs> but, you know, in the long run, when you take a DNA test, he's a man. No matter what he does to the outside appearance, he's a man, and that's who God made him to be. And so be who God made you to be and do it to his glory, to his glory, so that he would be glorified in your life. 